Hi folks, welcome back. Okay, so this lecture we're going to talk about genus Paranthropus. Um, this is a kind of a, a side species. They're in our family tree, but they're not directly related to us. Uh, the, the best way I always say to think about this is like our ancestral uncle. Your uncle is related to you, but not directly. And that's kind of the idea here. Genus Paranthropus was another hominin. They're bipedal. They're living in the same place at the same time as the Australopiths that we met last time. But Genus Paranthropus is doing something very different. Remember, Darwin tells us that if two species in the same place at the same time are competing for the same resources or the same niche, one of them will go extinct. Well, it just so happened that they were able to eat stuff that the other Australopiths were not eating. We're going to talk directly about those things in just a minute. Okay, so the group that we're talking about are these guys down here. Paranthropus ethiopicus, which is the earliest one. Here's his little line. Paranthropus robustus, which is up here. And Paranthropus boisei. Now, you can see... Of the three, Boisei was the one around the longest. Robustus was just around during the reign of Boisei, really. And Ethiopicus pops up early and then fades into Boisei. Ethiopicus was probably the precursor to what became Boisei. Robustus was living in a different place from Boisei, and they are probably related, but they're probably more directly related to Australopithecus africanus. And we'll talk about what these three are doing and why they're in this little subsection called Paranthropus. Let's start with Paranthropus ethiopicus. As I've mentioned before with the names, let's start with their genus name Paranthropus, P A R A. It's para, like paramilitary. It's very similar to the Australopiths, but not quite the same. In other words, they're very much like the rest of the hominins in everything except for what they're doing with their heads. They seem to be designed for chewing. And we'll talk about what that means in a minute. Everything else in their body, from the neck down, they were identical, really, to the Australopiths living side by side with them. The difference was they were eating different food. So, para means similar, but not quite the same, like paramilitary. Ethiopicus. Where does it sound like he's from? Ethiopia. So, we've met a lot of these in East Africa. We've met uh, Australopithecus afarensis was in East Africa. We've met Sahelanthropus chadensis was in East Africa. Uh, Kenyanthropus platyops. Um, all of those and Garhi were all in East Africa. The others that we've met were in South Africa. Now there are some thoughts, some groups, some schools of thought that give a lot of credence to the South African clade versus the East African clade. And the truth is there's nothing really keeping them apart. There's no giant mountain range or huge desert or massive ocean, nothing to keep them from wandering down from one place to the other. So my thought is, it's just because we haven't been digging in the Central African area that we haven't found any of these in Central Africa yet. Most of that is because of the politics of those areas. They're very dangerous right now. So let's get back to talking about Paranthropus ethiopicus. We're just going to talk about the ones we know about. First of all, a large sagittal crest. What does that mean? This sagittal crest. Well, sagittal means right down the middle. It's like a mohawk. The sagittal crest, you can see on this little fella, is like a mohawk made out of bone. What is that for? That's actually an attachment point for these massive chewing muscles that come up and around here. Going along with that, we have these huge flaring zygomatics. The zygomatic arch, this is it right here. You can see this little arch that goes out. There's a big hole right through here, underneath, behind the cheekbone here. That attaches this huge muscle that's coming up down off the side of their head, down through to their jaw, their lower jaw, their mandible. That is a chewing muscle, this big, massive muscle that goes through here. There's other chewing muscles attached out here, 
But this flaring zygomatic and this sagittal crest tells us this muscle going through here is huge. <clears throat> now, in real life, if we were face to face, I'd pull out a couple of skulls and I'd show you the size differences of these zygomatics. I can't do that in three dimensional, I mean, in two dimensional space here. So, what I'm going to do is talk you through that as best I can. The flaring zygomatics, that means their cheekbones are really that uh, kind of uh, line of bone. You can feel it on yourself. If you take your fingers and touch your cheekbone right on that corner of your cheekbone and then roll it back, you can feel bar of bone that goes really from your cheekbone all the way back to your ear. That's what we're talking about. That is the zygomatic arch. And through behind that, is a massive chewing muscle. You can actually feel that muscle too. If you put your fingers on your temples, your temple area, right behind your eyes, on the sides of your head, and bite down, you can feel those muscles flexing. Not surprisingly, going along with all these huge chewing muscles, we've got big teeth. The teeth of Paranthropus, particularly the molar teeth, are massive. And we'll see that quite clearly when we talk about Paranthropus boisei. But first, let me show you Paranthropus ethiopicus's glamour picture. This is his glamour shot, his little three-quarter view. But in this view, you can very clearly see, and I'll point some things out here. The sagittal crest, this mohawk of bone, is built quite big on this guy. This is all an attachment point for those muscles because there's not enough real estate on the side of the head to attach all that muscle tissue to, so it actually builds up this huge crest of bone. Conversely, there's a big hole here. You guys see this hole going right through here behind this bar of bone? That is for that massive chewing muscle to go through. This hole is much bigger. I've got pretty big fingers, but I can stuff about three or four fingers through this guy's zygomatic arch. In a adult human, anatomically adult human, modern, I can stick about a finger, maybe two, squished through our zygomatic arches. Ours is less than half the size of these guys. It tells you they're doing a lot of chewing. Paranthropus robustus also has a sagittal crest, massive molars. They've got a bigger brain than Ethiopicus, but not as big as what Boisei shows us. Now, the word robustus, the name, the word robust, comes from heavy or heavily built. We'll see this robustus term used again when we talk about how big and burly Neanderthals were, and that'll come much later. But right now, just know that that's where the name Robustus comes from. This is actually one of the first ones discovered, although not the first one to exist. We see this a lot. We don't see the first things to exist pop up out of the ground first because they're buried deeper. So this guy pops up in South Africa. And as I mentioned before, it really doesn't matter where they were found as far as the African continent as long as we're below the Sahara Desert. That's the massive thing that keeps, keeps things separate on that continent. But really, East Africa, South Africa, and if you ask me, Central Africa, will all probably have very similar uh, animals running around on it, as certainly at this time. So they have a sagittal crest, massive molars, a slightly larger brain than Ethiopicus. We don't really see a bump up in brain size anytime soon with Paranthropus. This species didn't last long, but what's most obvious, especially in this picture, are these flaring zygomatics. Look at how far out these cheekbones go. This guy would be a great model. He's got very hard cheekbones. But you can get an idea of how massive this chewing muscle is because of the size of these cheekbones shooting out to either side. Last but not least, we're going to talk about Paranthropus boisei. I always do this. What's the capital of Idaho? Boise, Idaho. Well, boisei was not found in Idaho. 
it's not from Idaho, but the family that founded Boise, Idaho, thus their name, was very well off. And they put a significant amount of funding into finding this species. So as a, as a little tip of the hat, the people who discovered this, this uh, individual fossil named it Paranthropus boisei as a thank you to the family that lent them the money to do the, the research. So that's where it gets its name. But these guys were the most successful of the three Paranthropus. They lasted the longest. We can see that with that line. I'm going to talk about fossil success again in just a minute. They have an even larger brain than Ethiopicus and even a slightly larger brain than that of Robustus. But again, it's not getting huge, not yet. But these guys did have massive molar teeth. I'll show you a picture of their molars in a minute. So Boise Eye also shares the, all the trademarks of a Paranthropus. They've got a sagittal crest, although this one's mostly broken and missing. They've got huge flaring zygomatics, again, broken and missing, but you can see they were there. And these massive molar teeth. The front teeth aren't that big. Here's the canine, here are the four incisors. They're actually fairly small, but those molar teeth, this tells us a lot of what they were eating. Here's Boise Eye's glamour shot. Ooh la la. But here, more importantly, are their teeth. This on the left is an anatomically modern human's teeth. You can see a, a few things. First of all, the dental arcade is more of a kind of an arch, whereas these guys, we've really got a parallel and then closed off the front. This is his canine tooth. Very tiny, so he's still following that idea of the canine teeth getting smaller over time. What these, what these guys reverse is the molar teeth, in particular, these three in the back, are absolutely huge. If you look at the size of these molar teeth, they're about four or five times the size of a modern human's molar teeth. What does this tell us? This tells us that they're eating tough to eat, tough to chew foods. Boise Eye's nickname was actually Zinjanthropus, which really means nutcracker man, meaning he was able to chomp right through really tough to eat stuff, nuts, legumes, things like uncooked or raw, tough veg vegetable matter. So these guys were chewing really tough stuff, the stuff that Australopithecines didn't want to eat. This takes away the competition for food between these two species, and lo and behold, they can live side by side. We're going to see that side by side living in just a minute. I'll show you the timeline again, and we can see how they live fine side by side with not just the Australopiths, but actually another group as well. So, what was the relationship? Fundamentally, Australopiths and Paranthropists are eating different foods. The Australopiths are sticking with what we call higher quality foods, meaning the fruit, the soft, very, very uh, nutrient dense foods. They're still not getting into things like meat or really high quality cooked stuff that we start seeing later with anatomically modern humans, which allows us to make this smaller gut, larger brain jump. But Paranthropus, the Paranthropus are eating a much lower quality, tougher to eat foods, but because they're eating different foods, they're occupying different niches and they can live side by side without any problem. Now, most of this time, especially when we talked about Australopithecus afarensis, and of course, when we talk about Boise Eye, I mentioned they were very successful. This is hominin success. How do we gauge that? Well, fundamentally, we gauge it by how long they were living on the planet. I alluded to this in the last uh, lecture, but I thought it would be a good time to have an actual slide that can show you guys what we mean by hominin fossil success. If a species was living on the Earth for a long time, 
they were very successful. That means they were able to adapt to their changing environment very well. Now, this isn't talking about technology, not yet. They're not really using a whole lot of technologies yet. They may have been using some tools, as do almost all primates, but they probably weren't living in buildings yet or shelters. They probably weren't using fire yet. A lot of things that we use that made, that opened up the planet that we could sort of occupy everywhere, we're not seeing just yet. As far as clothing, things like that, not yet, not yet. This means they were extremely adaptable. Consider this. Most of these species that we've been talking about have been around nearly a million years. Some of them even more than that, which we'll talk about later. Think about this. Anatomically modern humans have been on this planet for less than a third of that time. We've been around just about 300,000 years. Think about how short, how brief a time that is. This chart shows you Homo sapiens, that's us, right here, this little blip. Look at how short this blip is compared to all of these species we've been talking about. Afarensis, look at that. Look at the length of Afarensis's line compared to our little blip. Look at the length of Robustus, who is considered really not all that successful, all things considered. But look at his line compared to ours. Boise Eye, look at that. Just about a million years for Boise Eye. That is an extremely successful species. Ethiopicus probably wasn't around all that long. Africanus was around for a long time. But now look at this. Here's Paranthropus, starting right here at about two and a half million years ago, we see Paranthropus ethiopicus. But look, you're living side by side with Africanus, Garhi, Sediba, well, just at the end there, and at the beginning of Homo habilis. Look at that. Now Boise Eye. Look at Boise Eye and Robustus absolutely overlap not only Australopithecines, but genus Homo, at least in the beginning. Here we've got Homo habilis. This is actually the start of Homo erectus. This one I would put right in here with Homo erectus. Look at Boise Eye and Robustus living right there, side by side with these guys, up until nearly one million years ago. That is astonishing. That right there tells us that they were very, very successful.